Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Much like General Patton, Donald Trump believes the best defense is a good offense. So after BuzzFeed published an unverified document suggesting he'd been co-opted by the Russian government, Trump launched an all-out attack on the press during today's news conference, his first since last July. It was a high-energy event, to say the least. Here's a highlight reel of what happened. I will be the greatest jobs producer that God ever created. As far as hacking, I think it was Russia, but I think we also get hacked by other countries and other people. I will say again, I think it's a disgrace that information would be let out. Uh, I saw the information, I read the information outside of that meeting. Uh, it's all fake news, it's phony stuff. It didn't happen, it was a group of opponents that got together, sick people, and they put that crap together. Hacking's bad, and it shouldn't be done. But look at the things that were hacked. Look at what was learned from that hacking. If Putin likes Donald Trump, guess what, folks? That's called an asset, not a liability. Now, I don't know that I'm gonna get along with Vladimir Putin. I hope I do, but there's a good chance I won't. Well, I'm not really saying the tax returns, because as you know, they're under audit. But every president uh, since the 70s has been Oh, gee, I've never heard that. Oh, gee, I've never decade. heard that. Don and Eric are going to be running the company. They are going to be running it in a very professional manner. They're not going to discuss it with me. Again, I don't have to do this. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, not you. Not you. Your organization, Sarah. Your organization, Sarah. As far as BuzzFeed, which is a failing pile of garbage, writing it, I think they're going to suffer the consequences. They already are. So news organizations publish untrue content all the time, but to their credit, it's usually by accident. On Tuesday, BuzzFeed chose to release a 35-page dossier on Trump whose contents even BuzzFeed's editors admitted could not be verified. In fact, the publication said explicitly, quote, the report contains errors. BuzzFeed's conduct may be among the worst excesses of yellow digital journalism, but many are arguing their decision to publish that piece was justified. We're joined now by Matthew Ingram of Fortune Magazine, who authored a piece today defending BuzzFeed. Matthew, thanks a lot for coming on. Thanks for so, having me. One of my favorite reporters, uh, Michael Tracy, wrote something this morning that made me think of this. He said, and I'm quoting, he said, WikiLeaks relentlessly attacked for publishing verified, authentic information. BuzzFeed is cheered for publishing what is a total sham. Y you have been critical of WikiLeaks for publishing emails that did not belong to them, and yet you're cheering the publication of material that is clearly wrong. Why? In fact, I was supportive of WikiLeaks. Um, I, I support their attempts to publish documents that would otherwise go unpublished. I support BuzzFeed's decision to do the same when those documents are clearly part of an important story. They said they were unverified. They didn't say that everything in there was true. All they said was these documents are being discussed at the highest levels. Senior intelligence agents have effectively said this source is credible, and yet no one is showing you this document. I think they did a public service. Well, first of all, I just read a piece that you wrote criticizing the release of those WikiLeaks emails. But to the point of on BuzzFeed, there are lots of things that are discussed privately, especially during campaigns, and you're a working journalist, so you know this well, that we don't publish because we're not certain if they're true. And the bar is higher when they're personal and they're damaging to people's reputations. And isn't it our job to verify their veracity? Isn't that why we exist? Isn't that why we have reporters in the first place? Sure it is, and I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen. In fact, BuzzFeed is working and has been working for months, according to Ben Smith, to verify the things that are in that document. So it's not that by publishing they're saying we accept all of these things as true. What they're saying is that this document has been presented to the president, has been presented to senior members of the intelligence community, and all the current, all the reporting before BuzzFeed said there is this document but we're not going to tell you what's in it but it's really important and in fact it could affect the entire trump administration it could call into question the entire government isn't that something that people should be able to see well i don't know if it's not true it's not going to affect the trump administration presumably in unless the media trotted out there and treat it as if it's significant look you know as well as i we hear all kinds of things i've heard all sorts of things about barack obama's romantic life for example i have no idea if any of them are true i hope they're not I would never report that. They're probably lies spread by his opponents. 
That often happens. Isn't it irresponsible to pass on something you can't verify? I, I don't understand how you couldn't see that as a journalist. Well, look, news organizations of all kinds, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, some of the leading journalistic organizations out there, routinely write stories that are based on information that they haven't verified. Did the New York Times verify all the information that was in all the emails that they reported on? No. Did they, re did they verify every fact that was in information that they got from intelligence sources? No. They, they based those reports on the credibility of the source. That's and right. in this case, you've got a senior intelligence agent who w is reportedly credible, according to CNN sources, is, is, whose information has become part of a document that was presented by the senior intelligence chiefs of the United States, comes from a source that, according to the Wall Street Journal, worked in, in Russia for a decade or more, has 20 years of experience in Russia. That sounds like a credible source to me. No, so it actually, seems to me I, it's I think worth you've got this, the, the story wrong. I mean, let me just say to your first point, journalists publish information, as I said at the outset, all the time that's wrong. They trust sources when they shouldn't. But they almost never publish information that they know to be inaccurate, as BuzzFeed did and admitted at, in the introduction to the piece. Second. We don't know much. Yeah, about there were place senior. names that were in. There were place okay, names that were inaccurate. There were people's names that were inaccurate. That doesn't but, but, mean the central facts of the document are inaccurate. It just means the person was in a hurry. But we don't know that any of it is true, and some of it apparently is false. It's been denied by everybody involved in it, and there's no evidence that any of it is true. And by the way, it was not written by any senior <laughs> intelligence official. It was written as campaign opposition research by a private sector guy in Great Britain. We think. That's all we know. He was not a member of, of MI6. No CIA officer wrote this. This is not official intelligence information. And by the way, the intel agencies scoop up all kinds of rumor, innuendo, disinformation, as you know, all the time. We would never publish sure that if it hurt Hillary Clinton, ever, would we? I think lots of organizations would, and I think lots of organizations effectively did exactly that. So why is this different? N if it, name if it name a news organization. Well, then name one. You just made the allegation. I, I, have, I have literally no idea what you're talking about. I covered the campaign pretty closely. Name a major news organization that published knowingly untrue information about Hillary Clinton that came from an intelligence source. I, I don't know what you're talking you're about. Saying Buzzfeed, you're saying BuzzFeed knows this to be untrue. I'm saying they know that certain facts in this dossier are provably untrue, and they have not proven and they a single that. fact in here, and they're conceding it. So. Your justification so did of every, well, did every people detail, are talking about it. Did every detail of every Hillary, Hillary Clinton story, was it verified by the journalistic organizations that published those stories? Yes or no? No, no. There okay. were details, however, So then that why is that there. acceptable and this is not? This because is, not this is from a single, senior intelligence well, source. I'll tell you, I'll tell if you. you no, it's not if from you a, read that Wall Street Journal so story, this guy was a senior MI6 agent, decades of experience in Russia. I'm, I'm this sorry. is not a guy who just wandered in off the street this, what and you said he heard something in Moscow about incorrect. Donald Trump. This was not written okay. by a senior MI6 official. This was written by a guy who works for a corporate intelligence company in London who may or may not have worked for British intelligence. He is not a member of British intelligence. He did not write this as a member of British intelligence. A. B. Not one He was a member was, of British intelligence. Not what he, he wrote is this. Is the Wall Street Journal story true? And nobody think? is that British intelligence came up with this dossier? I think you are factually wrong on that point. British intelligence is the Wall Street Journal story I'm not about who the produced Wall this Journal. correct? I'm merely saying this is not a product of British intelligence. It is the product of a private company in London. A. B. Yes. To Hillary's emails, That's not a accurate. single one was proven wrong. Not one. And so, by the way, lots of news organizations passed on it. But when this is proved totally false, not one person is saying this is true. There's not one person to stand up and say this is true, including the man who purportedly wrote it. So would you publish this yourself if you were running a news organization? Yes. Then you have low standards. I'm sorry. We devalue <laughs> our credibility when we publish things that we know aren't true and can't prove are true. To pass on something like this is not a defense of Trump. I've said this about Obama and Hillary. This is, a document, this is a document that made up a briefing by all the senior intelligence agencies in the United States for the President of the United States. This is an important document that's been circulating through the highest levels of the U.S. government. Okay. It, You're throwing it's, words it's around you don't understand. It's been the subject of letters from senators. The hot, this is look, a document that people McCain, need to no. see.
This came across John McCain's desk, and he passed it by his own admission to the director of the FBI, who sent it up the chain because who knows what this is. Not one person has said it's true. Not one person has said, I believe this is true. Not one person implicated in it has said, I have evidence that it's true. There's no evidence at all that it's true. It's almost certainly false. You know it. And for political reasons, you think it's okay. And I'm just saying that to values yes. journalism. That's my only point. According to, according to a senior BBC reporter, he has an, a source that has made the same allegations. All right. That's two sources now. Are you saying the BBC is reporting things that aren't, I'm, that aren't I don't true? even know who this guy I wouldn't be a first. I don't know who I don't even know who you're talking about. If evidence comes in that this is true, if anybody involved in this can say, I was there, I know this is true, here's the evidence, I'll be the first one to say, wow, Donald Trump, what's this about? But it doesn't exist yet, and so we shouldn't be throwing around hearsay. We exist to stop hearsay, not perpetuate it. I'm out of time. I'm sorry. Matthew, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Trump demonstrated this morning that his approach to media relations is different from that of President Obama's. Here's what the president-elect had to say this morning about BuzzFeed and CNN. As far as BuzzFeed, which is a failing pile of garbage, writing it, I think they're going to suffer the consequences. They already are. And as far as CNN going out of their way to build it up, and by the way, we just found out I was coming down, Michael Cohn, I was being, Michael Cohn is a very talented lawyer, he's a good lawyer in my firm. It was just reported that it wasn't this Michael Cohn they were talking about. So all night long, it's Michael Cohn. I said, I want to see your passport. He brings his passport to my office. I say, hey, wait a minute, he didn't leave the country. He wasn't out of the country. They had Michael Cohn of the Trump Organization was in Prague. It turned out to be a different Michael Cohn. It's a disgrace what took place. It's a disgrace. And I think they ought to apologize to start with Michael Cohn. Well, for more on the new president's posture toward the press, we're joined by the man who will face off against the media every single day, incoming White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer. Sean, thanks for coming on. Thanks, so, Tucker. Congratulations on the show. Oh, well, thank you. So you were obviously there when this happened, but there was this really interesting exchange with Jim Acosta from CNN. Uh, who kept trying to ask a question, and the president-elect finally said, no, I'm not taking a question from you, you're fake news. Here's what Jim Acosta said about you later in an interview on his channel, CNN. He said, quote, after I asked and demanded that we have a question, Sean Spicer, the incoming press secretary, you, did say to me that if I were to do that again, I was going to be thrown out of this press conference. Did that happen? So what happened was, after the exchange that you just noted, he did it again towards the end. He continued to harass the president-elect. After the president-elect had ended the press conference and been removed from the area, I went up to Mr. Acosta and I said that his behavior was rude, inappropriate, and disrespectful to the president-elect. He right. told me that he thought that he had a right to ask a question, even though CNN had been granted a question to one of their other correspondents. I informed him that I thought that no one should be treated that way and treated that disrespectfully. And that if he did it again in the future, I would have him removed. I don't, Tucker, you know, I've known you a long time. You know I'm a pretty solid Republican. I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat or an independent, but if someone did that to President Obama or President Clinton or, frankly, any other human being, I would say the same thing. No one needs to be treated with that level of disrespect and rudeness. I think Mr. Acosta owes the president-elect and, frankly, the entire press corps an apology for his childish and inappropriate behavior. So the president-elect basically made that same point. I mean, from the podium, he said, you're fake news. And it got me thinking that during the campaign, there were news organizations that were banned from Trump events. And I'm sort of wondering now why. I mean, the, the president-elect is certainly capable of responding directly to people he doesn't like in the media. He's pretty good at it, and I think he probably gets some sympathy from viewers when he does it. So why would he ban news organizations when he so clearly enjoys batting him around? Well, he's not, and I think as he enters the presidency, he is committed uh, to ensuring that the people's house has access to the press. And, and again, I don't yeah. think you're going to see that, but I think that what the, what the president-elect did today is something he's done in the past. He's going to do it again. He's going to set the record straight. He's not going to let dishonest members of the media have factually inaccurate stories about him, his administration, or his attempts to make this country better without him responding and responding forcefully. And that's the right. thing, is that I think for a lot of these folks in the media, they're used to the, these politicians sitting back and taking it. And that's not who Donald Trump is. He fights back and he wins. So the, the story really today was about BuzzFeed, which printed that dossier uh, on its website, 35 pages of what you say is totally false uh, allegations about Donald Trump. 
You describe BuzzFeed today from the podium, I'm quoting, as a hugely irresponsible left-wing blog that was openly hostile to Trump during the campaign, all of which is demonstrably true. And yet it was the RNC. Nice. Yeah, well, I think it's, that's accurate. I mean, on the merits, you're right. But the RNC, as I remember, during the campaign, reserved over a million dollars of space, signed a contract with BuzzFeed to put Trump ads on BuzzFeed. Why would the RNC do business with the irresponsible left-wing blog that was hostile to its candidate? Well, so that's a great question. It's twofold, though. First of all, let me just be clear. The story that BuzzFeed posted last night, its own editor put as a footnote that they were unsure of the information that they were putting out, and they should be taken with caution because it right. was unsubstantiated. So, I mean, just to be clear about the story that they published themselves. But second of all, to get to your question about the campaign, we reserve time across 56 different platforms. So everything from, you know, the Daily Caller, Fox News, uh, BuzzFeed. Right. And the idea was we didn't have to put any money down. We could reserve uh, time and ads across over 50 platforms, whereas we came down the final stretch of the election, if our data told us the missing voters were on the Huffington Post, or if they were on Newsmax, or if they were on FoxNews.com, that we had the time reserved to go after those key constituencies where we knew that we had to get out the vote. The idea was to cover all of our bases across the political spectrum to be ready to ensure that we had the capability to go after the voters we needed. And frankly, if you look at the election in terms of the states that we did, we had an amazing candidate with an amazing message, and he combined that with an amazing data and digital operation and field operation that propelled us to victory. So we did exactly the right thing. We'll do it again. And I think it's going to be the gold standard going forward. But did you really think you were going to find Trump voters on an irresponsible left-wing blog? Well, I think in the summer of, of last year, in the when we reserved the time, the goal was April. to make sure that wherever we knew they were going to be, that we knew that there were people, for, even on the far left, that were upset with Hillary Clinton, that didn't trust her, that were open to a Trump message. You look at the number right. of people who supported Bernie Sanders. So sure, absolutely, we had to be prepared. And again, we put no money down across any platform. We reserved time to ensure that no matter where those voters were, and when you look at the breadth and depth of the vote and the movement that Donald Trump commanded, it wasn't just about Republicans and the conservatives. It was about independents, disaffected right. Democrats and liberals that were ready for change. And so we did exactly the right thing back then. I think that's, I think that's a fair point. So let me just uh, finally put in a plea to you. So I know that you're going to redo in ways that are not yet clear the way the press operation works at the White House, and it's probably overdue. And you're probably going to bring in a lot of people who haven't been allowed in the briefing in the past, and that's fine with me. But here's what I hope you guys don't do, which previous presidents, including the current one, have done assiduously, which is reserve interviews only for camp followers, for throne sniffers, for people who already agree with them. So you see President Obama doing interviews with, well, BuzzFeed and NPR and all these puffy little backlit pieces that he does, but never letting someone who asks real questions near him. Will you allow people who are going to really ask questions, hard questions, near President Trump? Absolutely. Look what he did today. Every one of the mainstream media, some of the left-wing media all got questions in. Uh, he's not afraid of anybody right now, and I think you aptly noted with respect to CNN. He's not, a, he's not afraid to back down from anybody, right, left, independent, center. Uh, he is tough. He's going to answer the questions uh, and, and deliver a very forceful message. So I don't think it has to do with the outlet. He'll take on anybody and deliver the, the message that he's going to make this country better again, wherever that, wherever, whoever wants to hear it and is willing to give him a shake for it. Does, does he like the brawling, or does he just seem to like the brawling? I mean, to the extent you can no, absolutely. You know, no, no, speak but, but for his again, mood, he seems he to like it. No, no, he, he, he enjoys actually talking about what he wants to do to make the country better again. He enjoys talking about the successes that he's had, whether it's carrier, uh, creating jobs with SoftBank or, or Sprint, or bringing down the, the, the tax burden that people are having to pay for the F-35 or the new Air Force One. But I think what happens is when people want to engage negatively with him or attack him, he's going to fight back. If you want to have right. a conversation and engage in a polite and respectful manner with the president-elect, he's going to treat you in kind. But if you come in hot and want to be disrespectful and rude, as Jim Acosta was today, he's not going to sit back and take it. This is a man who fights and wins. Noticed. Sean Spicer, thanks all for joining us. And congrats on the new job. Thanks, Tucker. Time now for Twitter Storm, our nightly forecast of social media's most powerful weather patterns. Donald Trump wasn't the only person looking to humiliate BuzzFeed and CNN for their recent reporting. Twitter user Mike was one of many who supported Trump's attacks on Jim Acosta of CNN. He tweeted this, you are a hack, Jim, and you work for a hack organization. Sad! Exclamation point.
the president's contribution to our language. BuzzFeed's spanking came next when Liam wrote this. BuzzFeed, the news source that brings you other hard-hitting stories like 10 things you'll definitely remember if you're a 90s kid, which I believe is an actual story. Into Blue tweeted this, I hate Trump and all, but I think BuzzFeed really screwed the pooch on this story. They just fueled the fake news fire, you think? Nancy J. May said this, let's make up a horrible story on BuzzFeed, see how they like it. Geds tweeted this, someone should remind BuzzFeed of the time Hulk Hogan sued Gawker straight out of business yesterday morning, if at all possible. Brian Duffield asked, does BuzzFeed survive 2017? And that was the consensus. Tonight's Twitter storm. Up ahead, Donald Trump has announced his plans for eliminating his ties to the Trump Organization to clear an ethics hurdle. But a former ethics attorney for George W. Bush said the plan is not enough. He joins us next with details. Also, Senate Democrats have been going hard after Jeff Sessions and Rex Tillerson will bring you the most electric moments of the hearing this morning, and there were some. What you mean? Well, Donald Trump's press conference this morning wasn't only about spanking his enemies in the media. Trump also announced his plans to avoid conflicts of interest by ending his involvement with his company, the Trump Organization. Here's part of what he said. My company is much bigger, much more powerful than they ever thought. We're in many, many countries, and I'm very proud of it. And what I'm going to be doing is my two sons, who are right here, Don and Eric, are going to be running the company. They are going to be running it in a very professional manner. They're not going to discuss it with me. Again, I don't have to do this. Well, some ethics experts say the new plan does not come close to resolving potential conflicts of interest, ones he may face as president. We're joined from Minneapolis by someone who says that. He is Richard Painter. He's a law professor who served as an ethics attorney for President George W. Bush. Richard, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. So, well, thanks for having me, Tucker. You heard what the president-elect said. He said, look, I'm distancing myself from the company. My boys are taking it over. Neither my daughter nor I will have any conversation with them about how it runs. They're divesting uh, from a bunch of foreign deals they have, and they're taking the profits from the foreign deals still in place and putting them into the U.S. Treasury. Why is that not enough? Well, the problems uh, remain if uh, the president is going to own the businesses. Uh, first, uh, they only address the, far, the profits uh, from foreign government transactions with the hotels. We haven't heard about what they're going to do about loans from foreign government-owned banks and leasing space uh, to foreign government-owned companies. So we haven't heard a comprehensive plan for sweeping out all of the foreign government uh, money uh, before January 20. And that's absolutely critical to uh, comply with the Constitution. But we also have some serious uh, questions about these buildings around the world with the Trump name on them. Uh, having right. the president's name on a building outside the United States, particularly in places like the Philippines or Indonesia or Turkey, uh, well, uh, as I uh, uh, see in the news quite frequently, there are a lot of security concerns over there. And uh, it would be uh, very tragic to have a building get attacked and people lose their lives uh, because well, sure. the president's name is on the building. And they need to address but, but, that. But I haven't heard any. Get, uh, right. But that's a, that's a separate, I mean, that's a legitimate question, of course, but that's really yeah. a, a matter to be resolved by the building owner, I would think. Um, but back to, the ethics, back to yeah. the ethics question. I mean, certainly you've had presidents who have investments, who have money that's working for them as they're serving. LBJ famously did, but I think a lot of presidents have, and it didn't seem to stop their presidency in the tracks. Why is Trump different? Well, a lot of his uh, uh, profits is uh, from putting his name on buildings and licensing his name out. So it's up right. to him whether his name's on a building or not. Uh, and he may have a contract with the building owner, but he can say, look, I'm president of the United States. It's dangerous to have my name on that building. We're not going to be able to protect it. I want my name off of all buildings outside okay. of the United States. Well, that may be the right thing to do from a, okay, that, and you may be writing that from yeah. a humanitarian perspective. Perhaps that's the right the right call. But I mean from an ethics perspective, which is what yeah. I think everybody, pro-Trump and anti-Trump, is concerned about. I mean, it could gum up his administration if he gets in ethics trouble. And so my question is, Absolutely. why is what he's doing not enough? Can he own well, the company but yeah. not run it? A lot of people do that, I think, don't they? Well, the operations uh, overseas, uh, we're going to get into the issue of who has to pay for security for the buildings. Who has to pay uh, when he gets into a business operation overseas? And there's some uh, a person 
who has influence of a foreign government overseas, who then is uh, trying to influence the United States government policy. Uh, these are serious conflicts of interest. Uh, and just to say, well, his sons are running the business, he's not running the business. Uh, a lot of these businesses are with people, are connected with foreign governments, and uh, he's in charge of protecting the interests of the United States of America. Right. Uh, and not getting himself entangled all over the world or having his sons on his behalf entangled in business deals all over the world. He could sell a lot of it off. He could have a couple of billion dollars, uh, which is great, and then focus on running the country. Uh, this is a very, very important job, and he's been chosen by the American people, and he needs to give that the number one priority. And, and this right. is just too much of a distraction. Plaintiff's lawyers are going to be shooting at this thing right and left with lawsuits. Uh, they love suing the president of the United States. We're so I'm, I'm president Clinton. Uh, well, that you're, we you're, that. I mean, a lot of what you're saying is, is, is of course, true. But I'm having trouble discerning what is a, an ethical problem, like legitimate ethical conflict for him, and what is just unattractive or bad PR. Anything that interferes with his ability to be the best possible president of the United States. Yes. It is an ethical problem. His obligations are to the United States. He's going to take an oath next Friday to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. And right. he's going to have to defend us against enemies, foreign and domestic. And there, this is a dangerous world we live in. And we can't right. have a president tied down with personal business holdings. Okay. We wouldn't want to have a, a FDR at the time of World War II if he'd have properties in Berlin and Frankfurt. Uh, that would have been a disaster. So I, I think okay. that it's time to sell the businesses and be president. All right, Richard Painter, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tucker. Up next, what does the leaked dossier on Trump say about our intelligence agencies? Has their effectiveness been compromised by hostility to the president-elect? Some are saying that, including the president-elect himself. Former CIA director and ambassador Jim Woolsey will join us in just a minute with his view. Well, Donald Trump is irate enough over unverified rumors of Russian influence over him, some of which have apparently leaked from the intelligence world. He's comparing U.S. intelligence services, or appears to be, to the Third Reich. He tweeted this today, quote, Intelligence agencies should never have allowed this fake news to leak into the public. One last shot at me. Are we living in Nazi Germany? Where are these leaks coming from in the first place, which is a fair question, and how worried should we be about what it means that intelligence services may be leaking them. We're joined now by Ambassador James Woolsey, who previously served as CIA director under Bill Clinton, and until last week was an advisor to the Trump transition team. Ambassador, thanks for joining us tonight. Sure. So, Good to be with you, Tech. So Mr. Trump's, President-elect Trump's position uh, seems to be, and a lot of people share this view, that a lot of the stuff is coming from disgruntled employees in the executive branch who work for various intelligence agencies who don't like him, they favored Hillary Clinton, and they're trying to undermine him before he even takes office. Do you think that's true? Uh, so this is uh, something separate from the, the BuzzFeed uh, uh, stuff. Um, I suppose there could be some uh, uh, people, I think it would be a very small number, that would do something like that. But I think the, the number is tiny. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, far more likely to be uh, invented uh, stuff uh, from, you know, in the Washington scene that, uh, that gets uh, tossed into the hopper. Right. Well, I mean, a lot of, if, if you're just an ordinary news consumer like me, uh, a lot of the conclusions from the so-called intelligence community are filtered through press accounts. And if you've been reading the Washington Post, for example, or the New York Times these last couple of months, you've read that the intelligence community, again, whatever that is, believes that Donald Trump was the favored candidate of Vladimir Putin who seeks to influence him upon his taking office. That seems right. like the product of I, leaks I, to me. Well, I, it's hard to know where something like that is, is coming from. Uh, I, I think, for, for example, one bit of evidence, so-called, that was discussed a great deal was a medal. A medal was given to uh, 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 actually, I, I take it back. This is this is uh, to uh, the uh, right, incoming uh, uh, secretary, of, right, Tillerson, uh, the secretary of uh, 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 state. State. Um, yeah. But it gives a, a it, it gives a similar picture. 
uh, something like that gets tossed into the hopper and people don't dig down and see that that medal is the same one that's given to visiting athletes and uh, visiting uh, performers in the theater and is not any kind of sign of closeness or right. substantive uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, and the way, I think, the only way to pick out what's going to happen with Russia on substantive cooperation is to watch and see what their morale is and how they operate because we have to maintain I think a much firmer position uh, than the Obama administration did yeah. and I think that uh, uh, we will uh, if we do that we have a chance of uh, getting along reasonably well with the Russians but if we uh, uh, behave the way the government did during the Obama administration, the Russians will do everything possible to take advantage of that. I, I negotiated with them four times on four major treaties right. over a number of years. Uh, three of those times they were standard Russian behavior, uh, uh, doer, uh, 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 unhelpful, uh, prevaricating, uh, etc. One of the four was terrific. It was right after the Berlin Wall went down, so I don't think it was so much my negotiating skills as it was uh, uh, the, uh, some, the loss of confidence that they experienced as a result of that. But they were a delight to work with. Uh, we put together a 107-page treaty in six months covering all the non-nuclear weapons in Europe. Uh, it was fine until okay. Putin uh, renounced it uh, a few years ago. But, 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 it, yes, it, but we, they were, were easy to work with. Okay, but since but they're also hard to understand. Anyone else is hard to know. It's hard to know someone's motive. So when I hear the CIA say, we right. know for a fact that Putin supported Trump, wanted Trump to win, and advocated for his victory, sub rosa. My first thought is, well, how do you know that? How could you know that? How could you know what Putin wants? Who are you, God now? I, I mean, don't... Should, do I have right to be skeptical of claims like that? Uh, sure. I think it's perfectly reasonable to be skeptical of claims of that sort. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I don't think most of that is coming from the intelligence community. Uh, huh. I, I think it's banter around Washington. Uh, I, uh, okay. I don't. I don't think the hostility between Trump and the com and the committee, the community, is nearly uh, what uh, people are saying. I think it's remediable. Okay. I think it's uh, going to be relatively easy for them to work together as soon as there is a new government. Well, I hope. I hope that's true for everyone's sake. They'll get him in the end. Otherwise, I bet you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. Great to see you. Sure. Good to see you. Well, Donald Trump spent the day at war with the press. The Senate spent it at war with Trump's cabinet picks. In a break with Senate precedent, Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey testified against his colleague, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, who has, of course, been nominated to serve as attorney general. Louisiana Representative Cedric Richmond, meanwhile, complained that having to wait a day to attack Sessions was somehow evocative, brace yourselves, of Jim Crow. First, I want to express my concerns about being made to testify at the very end of the witness panels. To have a senator, a House member, and a living civil rights legend testify at the end of all of this is the equivalent of being made to go to the back of the bus. Senator Sessionson is unquestionably qualified for the job for which he has been nominated. He is a good Christian man and a good family man. He is a man who's dedicated his life to public service. And in the course of that, he has actually fought for, dis for the disenfranchised. He fought for sentencing reform. And not only, not only did he fight for it, he accomplished it. He fought for civil rights. He prosecuted members of the Ku Klux Klan. And most importantly, he has fought for the liberty of all Americans. Well, meanwhile, during a hearing on Rex Tillerson's nomination as Secretary of State, Senator Marco Rubio aggressively questioned Tillerson for refusing to call Vladimir Putin, quote, a war criminal. Watch. Let me ask you this question. Is Vladimir Putin a war criminal? I would not use that term. Based on all this information and what's publicly in the record about what's happened in Aleppo and the Russian military, you are still not prepared to say that Vladimir Putin and his military have violated the rules of war and have conducted war crimes in Aleppo. Now, those are very, very serious uh, charges to make, and I would want to have much more information before reaching a conclusion. I understand there is a body of record in the public domain. I'm sure there's a body of record in the classified domain. And I think in order, in order to deal with a serious question like this, Mr. Tillerson, the, uh, I would want to be, the public domain. The videos public, and the pictures are there. Fully informed 
before advising the president. This new administration must thread the needle between pushing back against Vladimir Putin's aggressions, meddling, interventionism, ambitions, and bullying, and at the same time, find a way to stop a dangerous downward spiral in our relationship with Russia. I believe Mr. Tillerson is the right person at the right time to help accomplish both of those goals. Well, the Senate's going to get a few more opportunities to poke at Trump's nominees, but it's unlikely they'll, they'll have a hard time blocking them. In the past 40 years, only six cabinet nominees have failed to be confirmed by the Senate. We'll be watching, of course. Up next, Russia says it's ludicrous to suggest they have compromising personal information on Donald Trump. Whether it's true or not, though, what is Russia's motive in all of this? Talk it over with one of this country's renowned Russia experts. Professor Stephen Cohen joins us next. Well, Donald Trump is the only... Well, Donald Trump is the only person dismissing the dossier about him as baseless rumor-mongering. Russia, which supposedly provided it, has called it an absolute fabrication and an attempt to sabotage U.S.-Russia relations. What are their motivations, Russia's, in this latest exchange? We're joined now by Stephen Cohen. He's a contributing editor for The Nation and a professor emeritus of Russian studies at NYU. Professor, thanks for joining us tonight. I'll, I'll confess, I don't know whether this dossier is real or not. But it's making some fairly serious allegations about Trump, allegations really of sedition. What do you make of it? Does it look real to you? Are you talking about the stuff released yesterday about the yes, that's right. sexual and financial blackmail? That's right, that he is basically a pawn in effect of Russia. They're blackmailing him to do well, the bidding. Well, this is, if not the end game, the last chapter in what appears to be an attempt to destroy Trump's presidency before he gets to the White House. As for that document published in BuzzFeed or whatever, uh, I've seen stuff like that before in Moscow. It's junk. Uh, you send me to Moscow and I could get you a better dossier than that. It wouldn't even have the factual errors in it. It's scuttlebutt. It's rumor. It's generated by so-called private intelligence agents who are out to make a buck. They'll sell it to anybody. But the question is, is what is it doing in our political discourse? What are the motives? I mean, why'd CNN put it on the air? Why is it is the FBI and the CIA even touching this stuff? Something's going on. I mean, I've been doing this, studying Russia as a professor, and sometimes even on the inside for more than 40 years. I've never seen anything like this. People huh. in the mainstream media, authoritative media, places like the New York Times, are calling Trump a puppet of the Kremlin. They're wounding him mortally as a national security president before he even gets in the White House. So I ask you, you live in D.C., I guess, what is going on? It's, it's, it's not clear to me, and this stuff comes at you so quickly, and it's, it's so esoteric. I mean, if you're a conventional reporter, you're not an expert on Russia. You don't know. I'm speaking for myself. And it's not, it, it doesn't look real, but then, you know, who knows? But as someone who has studied this for 40 years, this does not have the ring of truth to you, and you think this is, if I'm reading it correctly, part of a much larger effort to disable Trump before he becomes president. Well, it didn't begin with this. It began with the Clinton administration campaign, excuse me, last summer, when they decided to run against Trump and Putin instead of Trump and Pence. It got picked up with this so-called three intelligence agency report that was published last week. It's absolutely en empty. Even the New York Times, which is very anti-Trump and anti-Russian, refer to that intelligence report as lacking any evidence whatsoever. So now we get what is essentially tabloid stuff. I can only assume, it's an assumption, that people in this country are desperate to wound Trump for various reasons, and yes. one is to stop any kind of detente or cooperation with Russia. So I would submit to you, Tucker, that without a full debate about that possibility and the policies involved, this, these accusations against Trump have themselves become a grave American national security threat. Thank you for the reality check, Professor. It's hard to know, uh, and I appreciate your coming on and explaining that. Thank you very much. I hope you'll come back. Up next, what is it like inside a Donald Trump news conference? Fox's John Roberts enters the friend zone to tell us he was there today, and he's lived to tell about it. 
Uh, since you're attacking us, can you give us a question? Go since ahead. you're no, Mr. President go, elect, go Mr. Ahead. President elect, go ahead. since you are attacking no, our news not organization, you, not can you. you give us a chance? You are attacking our news organization. Can you give us a chance to ask a question, sir? Go ahead. Sir, can you state Mr. President elect, can you state categorically Mr. President elect, can you give us a question? You're attacking us. Can you give us a question? Don't be Can you give us a question? Can you not gonna give you a question? Can you state categorically? You are fake news. Sir, Go ahead. can you... <laughs> Did you see the man in the background behind the fake news guy from CNN? It was our old friend, John Roberts, and he joins us now in the friend zone. He was there. What was that like, John? Zucker, good evening to you. You know, I've been to a lot of press conferences uh, on the presidential level. I covered the White House from 1999 until early 2006. Uh, went to a lot of press conferences with President uh, Clinton, went to a lot with President George W. Bush, and I've never seen anything like what happened today. I mean, the mood in the room got really hot, got very combative. Jim Acosta, whom I've known since the days when we were at CBS News together back in the early 2000s, really kind of, I think, uh, just had a little bit too much of the frustration, uh, too much of the CNN S-U-C-K-S <laughs> that was directed his way from uh, all the folks at those Trump events over the months, and uh, I think he, he just kind of said, that, that, that's it, uh, I'm going to say my piece, <laughs> and he did. Well, so where, where was the sympathy of the rest of the press corps? Do, do you, I mean, to the extent you can measure the vibe in a room, do you think people were on Acosta's side or on Trump's side? You know, I think that uh, for the most part, there were a lot of people who were in that room who were on Acosta's side to say that, you know, Trump shouldn't be icing out uh, correspondence. Don't forget, he iced out the Washington Post for a couple of months uh, early in the election campaign. But then at the, at, the same, uh, at the same time, there were a lot of people who were thinking that, you know, this is, even though he's the president-elect, this is a presidential press conference, and you don't go yelling, go, don't go around yelling at the guy who's in charge. Uh, I know that something like that would not go over well at the uh, East Room at the White House you know, in a presidential press conference. So, yeah, you know, true. I've always uh, approached these things that even if you uh, want to get answers and you're determined to get the answers, you have to do it in a respectful way. And uh, I'll leave it to the folks at home to decide whether or not that happened today. Wow. Do you expect do you expect that press conferences or the, or the briefing over which Sean Spicer will preside is going to be like this? I mean, you're looking forward to four years of this? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe if Linda McMahon were the, <laughs> were the press secretary, we might see things like that encouraged. But uh, I, I don't necessarily know, uh, Tucker, that that's something that we're going to see. Uh, by the way, I, I should point out, we just received a release from the Office of the uh, Director of National Intelligence. Uh, James Clapper uh, called and talked to Donald Trump tonight expressing dismay over the fact that uh, this information was leaked. Uh, Clapper saying that this was not an official intelligence community document. This was something that was generated out of the private sector, these allegations about Russia trying to collect compromising information on Donald Trump. So uh, clearly wow. uh, the intelligence community has been sort of rocked by what's going on here, and, and they're trying to really walk it back. I was told by a senior Trump transition official that Clapper, Comey, and, and the others really are kind of running away from, from what's gone on in the last couple of days. Wow, that that's amazing news. Actually, thanks for breaking that, John. Great to see you tonight. It is. Glad you're okay. You bet. Yeah, it is. Thanks, Tucker. See ya. Coming up, some celebrities are still unable to cope with the fact Trump won the election. We'll tell you what the meltdown you two, the band, appears to be having. Coming up. Here's something new. If you're a U2 fan and you want the new album, you probably still haven't found what you're looking for. Why? Because while Election Day was a beautiful day for many people, U2 did not agree. The Edge told Rolling Stone, quote, the world is a different place after Trump's win, so the next album will have to be changed accordingly. That means a delay. Let's hope it's out by New Year's Day next year. See you tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern. Hannity's next.